dirt. This is not just any dirt. This dirt is special. It's from my family farm. It's been in my family and sustained my family for seven generations. The farm is located 130 miles from this red circle. It's a 300-acre square on a planet that Carl Sagan called this pale blue dot. My seven generations ago grandfather was a soldier in the Revolutionary War. We found his Continental Army pay vouchers doing genealogy research. He would tell you nothing is more important than the land. I used to ride around on the farm with my grandfather and his truck, watching him look at his crops, and I remember him beaming uh, at what he was growing. He would tell you nothing is more important than the land. So why would a city dweller whose career has been in technology and marketing, who has never farmed, who hasn't lived near the farm in 35 years, why would that person be interested in keeping a farm a farm? Because nothing is more important than the land, including a big fat check from a developer wanting to build McMansions on the farm. A career in business has shown me that technology, especially the Internet, is vital to all of us. But also vital is eating and having clothes and nurturing the land that nurtures all of us and has nurtured my family for seven generations. This dirt is important to me, but dirt is important to all of us because without what it produces we die. Nothing is more important than the land. But dirt is in trouble. Farm viability is really challenged in the post-tobacco era, especially in the southeast. And that challenge extends to manufacturing jobs and value-added supply chain jobs. It is a significant issue. As I looked at these trends, and wanting to keep my farm a farm, I decided I needed to try to do something. So naturally, I said, I'll do a few Google searches. I'll find a product with the cash per acre economics of tobacco. I'll order some and have someone plant it, and I'm good to go. Now, how hard could it be? Uh, I researched everything. Organic vegetables, stevia, blueberries, truffles. I contacted the biggest regional vineyard and said, I've got some land. I'd like to grow some grapes. Tell me which ones to plant. The owner looked at me and said, cattle. <laughs> he said, raise cattle. You will get killed trying to grow grapes. The market is very volatile, and they're weather sensitive. So I moved on. Uh, I researched solar panels. All of these options were problematic. They required uh, capital investment, new equipment. They were in markets that were uncertain with uncertain returns. Or they required thousands of acres of land to scale up to the point of profitability. So it was, uh, it was tough research. Quite frankly, it, it was lonely research. But I, I felt something had to happen for, for that farm to remain a farm. So I stayed at it. I stayed tenacious. And one day I stumbled upon an article uh, about a crop that was being grown in other countries that checked a lot of the boxes that I was looking for. And that crop was industrial hemp. It had the attributes that would allow it to be a transformative and a scalable opportunity for someone like myself. You could even plant it and harvest it using equipment that farmers already use to plant and harvest wheat. So I was, I was excited, but I was also concerned because hemp had a reputation uh, the only one that I knew uh, had a reputation, and I needed some backup. I kept researching, and I found a person from a couple hundred years ago uh, in, the, in the U.S. government archives to help, to help me with some backup. And this person said, the best hemp and the best tobacco grow on the same kind of soil. Yay! 
The former article is of the first necessity to the wealth and protection of the country, the latter never useful. Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> so I now had a founding father as a wingman. Uh, it was, I was feeling a little better about things, but I did not understand the economics, the, the, the modern economics of that crop. So I researched some more. And it turns out that not only does hemp thrive in the same soil and climate that tobacco does, the cash per acre economics are actually equal or better. Uh, this, was, this, this is when I began to get excited. The other piece that I learned in my research that was important is that industrial hemp is not marijuana. That, that, is, that is pretty darn important when it comes to advocacy because it's a different plant. It doesn't have the THC, that's the intoxicant, that is found in marijuana. So it's not marijuana. And it is being grown in other countries uh, besides the U.S. And they have built out industrial supply chains. And one of the reasons that it's become such a big part of the industrial supply chain in these other countries is because there are so many products that can be made from it that can be manufactured and sold at scale. And that is because the entire plant can be used in the supply chain. So there are effectively three parts to a hemp plant. The outer fibers, which are called bast, the inner fibers, which are the herd, and the seeds. All of these pieces can be used, and thousands of products can be made from them. And some of those products include paper. So one acre of hemp creates the equivalent pulp of four acres of trees, except... We can grow the hemp in 20 weeks. It takes 20 years to grow the trees. If we turned 1% of our farmland, which is 20 million acres, uh, into hemp planting just for paper pulp, we could stop cutting down trees for paper. And by the way, that $10 bill is from 1910. It's printed on hemp paper because that was the paper used for our currency for over 100 years. And the scene on the back of that bill is a hemp harvest in a farmer's field in the U.S. Biofuels are a huge opportunity with industrial hemp. So currently ethanol is primarily made from corn. And about 340 gallons per acre can be uh, gleaned from an acre of corn. Uh, hemp yields about double the amount of ethanol per acre as corn, and it's not a food stock crop, which is extremely important, and it requires only one-third the water. There is another biofuel that can be made from hemp, and that is biodiesel. And I'll say that that image is not whimsical. That's what it looks like. It's this beautiful, clear green oil. The University of Connecticut has converted hemp seeds into 97% biodiesel. It doesn't emit sulfur dioxide and it can be grown on infertile non-cropland soils. So again, we're not displacing food stock crops to create our biofuels. Plastics, the oil from the hemp seeds uh, can make very high quality plastic, which is biodegradable. 500,000 tons per year of bioplastic are used currently, and they are already being used by car makers, uh, including BMW, Audi, Ford, GM, Folks don't realize it, but the Mercedes C-Class car currently uh, contains 20 kilograms of hemp fiber and plastic. The image of the auto you see there is made in, that, that hybrid is made entirely from hemp plastic and hemp fiber. And it has been, it, it has been produced, it's in prototype now. Everyone knows hemp uh, from, from the rope uh, analogy, I'm sure, but it has a long history as a textile fiber. You can actually get three times the fiber per acre from hemp versus cotton uh, with half the water requirement. Again, really important. And it's not just canvas fabric anymore. Uh, it's quilting fabrics, hemp and silk blends. Uh, very fine hand fabrics can be made from hemp fiber. It's actually softer than cotton when it's completely extracted uh, and degummed. Hemp is a real superfood. The seeds can be eaten raw or roasted. They are 33% protein, 33% essential fatty acids, including omega-6, which is hard to find in the plant kingdom. And hemp seeds contain nine amino acids. So vegetarians that are looking for amino acids sometimes have trouble. Hemp seeds supply it uh, in, in, in good quantity. Six times more omega-3 than raw tuna, and it's high in dietary fiber. 
it checks every box. It is actually, it is a superfood. It's an overused word, but hemp seeds are a superfood. Pharmacology applications are very exciting. The CBD oil in hemp seeds, uh, unlike the THC in medical marijuana, does not have an intoxicant, but it has most of the medicinal uh, properties. So it has a significant advantage uh, for medical and pharmacology development. In fact, the federal uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services filed for a patent on CBD oil in the early 2000s, and it was granted for treatments around neurodegenerative and inflammatory disorders, including Alzheimer's. They still have this patent. Uh, in 2013, uh, the British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology did some research and concluded that the CBD oil and hemp seeds contain anticonvulsant, anti-inflammatory, anti-tumoral, anti-cancer, and antidepressant properties. There is a UK pharmaceutical company that has developed an anti-epilepsy -epile seizure drug, and that drug is currently fast-tracked in this country by our FDA for clinical trials. They hope to be selling it within a year, and it's made from hemp seed CBD oil. So, and a, a, just a few products, but a staggering array of, of, of applications, but there's more. Hemp in the environment. The hemp plant, because it grows so densely and so tall, the industrial hemp plant, is the best carbon trap per acre in the green plant family. A metric ton of hemp actually traps one and a half metric tons of carbon. And this has big implications for the carbon uh, tax credit offset market. Many uh, trucking companies now are investing in solar farms out west and using the tax credits to offset their carbon emission uh, levels for their trucking fleets. Hemp offers the opportunity to do that at a much higher scale and would be a fourth revenue stream for the, for the grower or the farmer growing the hemp. So when I, when I share this information with folks, I typically get two responses. One, why are we not doing this already? Or two, it's hemp. Isn't that radical? It's actually not if you look at the history of hemp. It started in China thousands of years ago in terms of its use, and it was an integral part of the Chinese economy. It migrated to Western Europe, and then with the exploration of South America and North America, it came over our way. Our colonial history around hemp is extremely strong. It, it, was, it was the bulk of the supply chain for most of the raw materials manufacturing in the 1700s, including fabric, lighting oil, uh, paper medicines, food. It was a key part of the economy. If you, did not, if you did not farm hemp and you had a farm, you were fined. You were required to grow 10 acres. In the state of North Carolina, there is, there is even stronger history. We were the beneficiary of the Naval Stores Act passed by England in 1705, and they were requiring the colonies again to produce hemp fiber and pine uh, pitch and tar for, for naval stores. They were paying... They were paying growers six pounds uh, per ton on hemp alone. And by 1768, North Carolina was producing 60% of the naval stores in the entire 13 colonies. So it was a very powerful uh, part of the supply chain. It continued to be so into the 1800s and the early 1900s. This blank slide is a very good metaphor for what happened next to hemp in this country. <laughs> In the 30s, the history came to a screeching halt. With the end of prohibition, there were some government regulatory agencies that didn't have anything to regulate anymore, so they went looking. And they grabbed everything they could find and threw it uh, into one pile. And unfortunately, industrial hemp was put in that pile, except magically for World War II. They made it legal again in 1941 for four years, even produced a movie called Hemp for America, uh, to encourage farmers to grow it. At the end of the war, it was made immediately illegal. Uh, and then we saw the uh, Reefer Madness film strips of the 50s going forward. F fast forward to a couple of years ago, a few other tenacious folks figured this out and said, we've got to do something to replace tobacco throughout the national economy as it was obviously winding down. So they were able to get some language inserted into the 2014 federal farm bill that said if each state would individually enable researcher pilot programs, industrial hemp, the non-THC version, could be grown. 
the first uh, legal cultiv cultivation started in 2015, and now 27 states in 2016 have approved pilot programs. So there is federal legislation in the Farm Bill, and now individual states are, pass are passing legislation to enable research and pilot programs. And thankfully, uh, North Carolina is one of those states. When I figured out this opportunity was, was bigger than just my farm, I was able to connect with a group in Raleigh, a 501c6 called the North Carolina Industrial Hemp Association, a very new organization, small, but with some super smart, super focused folks who basically got a bill drafted and run through the Senate and the House in about nine months. Governor McCrory signed that bill last July, so we have the legislation in place to start our own research and pilot program uh, in North Carolina. We are on pace to work toward the first planting of industrial hemp in this state in decades this spring. Now we have another dark slide for a reason. <laughs> there is one last piece of inertia on the part of uh, some government bureaucracy uh, that we are, we, are working, we are working through. Uh, and so folks ask me, upon seeing uh, this information, how can I help? And there really are two ways. The first way is to contact every center of influence you know, whether it be an elected representative or someone in your community, a charitable foundation. Share this information with them. It is extremely powerful. Number two, you can join the North Carolina Industrial Hemp Association. You can look them up online. I promise you uh, they are focused and as productive a group as I've ever been around in the nonprofit space. So you may ask, why would a city dweller whose career has been in technology and marketing, who has never farmed, want to keep a farm a farm? When I started this, it was absolutely about my farm and me, but I figured out quickly it was way more important than that. It's important to tens of thousands of families who depend on their farms for their livelihood. It's important for our value-added supply chain and manufacturing economy. It could reinflate our banks, and it's super good for our environment. So all of these things reinforce what we've talked about earlier today. Nothing is more important than the land. Thank you. <laughs>